Unarmed civilian protection is a form of protection of civilians in situations of violence or violent conflict, for example, or kind of uh, other political violence um, like we see, for example, at the moment um, with the military coup in Myanmar. Um, and it's a form of protection that relies on nonviolent means. So I'm a political scientist and international relations scholar. Um, so when you look at the literature, international literature on protection of civilians and situations of political violence and war, the majority of everything that's being researched on it is about armed protection. So it's, for example, about the United Nations sending troops to protect people. It's about regional organizations sending troops to protect people, or it's about states if they come, if they take their responsibility to protect people. It is mostly about organizations and institutions that use weapons and use violence to protect um, or to deter violence. Now, throughout history, um, but also very much kind of most recently in the last three decades, growingly, so to speak, more and more, there have been organizations and communities who have used other strategies. And I think Asia is a region that has been pioneering uh, in this historically speaking as well. So there are strategies people are using or can use that rely on active engagement, but engagement that is not based on weapons and not based on violence to protect civilians from physical harm. And we have a few uh, people today in this call who work with organizations um, who promote this type of work. For example, Nonviolent Peace Force, who work in, um, in Myanmar uh, and in the Philippines. Um, but we also have, I can see Jaya, for example, um, uh, who works for the Consortium of Bangsamoro Civil Society in the Philippines and um, who are also working um, with this type of nonviolent strategies. And we have Nerf also in the call, who is joining us from New York. So it's in the middle of the night, I think, for him who has worked a lot on how communities actually protect themselves. So sometimes it's outside actors, so international people coming in trying to help with nonviolent protection. Sometimes it's national organizations helping to protect people in their own country. And sometimes it's the very communities of people um, who are threatened by violence who protect themselves. Strategies um, of such nonviolent protection um, involve a whole range um, of, of ways of going about doing this. Um, one, um, one thing that has been used in both the Philippines and Myanmar, for example, is kind of the monitoring of conflict or of ceasefire agreements, um, where civilians monitor what is going on and report this to um, authorities who can then do something about violations of, uh, of, of law or of, of the ce ceasefire. Um, but there are also other forms, uh, like, for example, accompanying um, people who are under threat. So if you have human rights defenders, for example, and uh, you have somebody accompanying them in their work, that reduces the kind of threat levels too. So there's a whole range of, of strategies, and the people who know more about this because they work in this can add to this later on um, if they want. Um, but what is quite clear is that there's like a, a growing international community of organizations and people using these strategies as an alternative way of thinking about how to protect people from physical harm. Um, and and Nonviolent Peace Force as one of the big organizations internationally doing this work had a kind of a workshop series all around the world, which started in Southeast Asia a few years ago and then went to different regions in the world and brought together a lot of organizations doing this work or being interested in this work. So there is this going on. But if you look at the overall literature on peacekeeping, protection of civilians and peace building, this work is not reflected there. So we have here a field um, where the practice, what people actually do is way ahead of what we um, as we 
Now, why should why is it important what researchers know about this? Why should we study this at all? Um, research is useful in so far as it can can help us understand how this practice works. So it has been shown that it works quite well where it's being used. It can help us show uh, how it works and to spread it to other communities um, and kind of to basically grow this community of people who use and know about unarmed strategies. So this is basically the idea um, of the research. There, there are different forms and I will talk a bit about um, what kind of different forms of research we could do and what kind of questions we are interested in. Shantana uh, already in, said that this is uh, actually a research network. We are called Creating Safer Space. We are working across three regions and several countries. Um, so we're working in Latin America with colleagues in Colombia. We're also working together with colleagues in Africa, in Kenya and South Sudan. And we are working here uh, in this region um, with a specific focus on the Philippines and Myanmar, where um, unarmed civilian protection has already been established for quite some time, but also trying to bring in other um, people. And I've seen people are here saying hello from, from West Papua, um, hello from different regions. So to broaden and out this kind of network of people who know about and who know about and are interested in unarmed uh, civilian protection. Um, before I say what the kind of core areas of interest are that our research network is interested in, I would like to hand over to Suzanne. Suzanne has been working with the project um, for some time now and her main task together with some other um, people, some of whom are also here in the call, I think I've seen Ashish, um, has been working on, um, on trying to put together a database of knowledge that we already have about um, unarmed civilian protection. So academic texts, but also uh, NGO reports, for example, so to have one space on the internet where we find texts about um, non-violent means of protecting civilians in situations of violent conflict and political violence and also situations of self-protection of communities. And um, this database has grown to, I think, almost 600, over 500 at least um, items now. And one thing that Suzanne has done recently is actually look a bit across um, this literature and see what we actually, where the, where the research already is and what kind of the gaps in this literature are, what we don't know so much about. And then afterwards, I will say how we as a network try to focus on three specific areas of research. And we would like to invite you to participate in that to fill some of these gaps. Okay, yes. So as um, um, Birit said, I've been working on um, a study basically of the literature that has that is available at the moment. Um, and um, I've been working with um, some other research assistants in other areas. So I think most, most importantly for you today um, are the research assistants in Myanmar and the Philippines who've helped me. And they have um, uh, they have a lot more specific knowledge on the region um, and they, they also wrote um, great reports on this or are in the process of setting the reports up. Um, so if you want more specific information, then, then it, it is coming. So that's great. Um, and it also means that there will be a lot more specific research on the region um, that you are working in um, uh, that will be covered in the database as well. So basically what I've done is look at the English literature that's available and a bit of French, but that's, I'm not like Beirut, I don't speak five languages, um, but um, just, just the English literature mostly. Um, uh, and looked at what the what research has already been um, done. And so I wanted to share with you today some of the gaps that we found. So where we think um, there is um, not enough or we can do more research. Um, with this Creating Saver Space project. Um, so for example, um, when it comes 
there's a geographical focus. Um, a lot of um, regions are being looked at, but it's still mostly dominated by um, Colombia, for example. Um, there's a bit of general, um, it could be broadened uh, a lot, we think, um, especially because we know they're organized that are doing uh, protection work. Um, there's also a, a very specific focus on actors. So what we find in the, the literature or the research that has already been done is that there's a lot of focus on international UCP organizations. Um, so for example, Nonviolent Peace Force, Peace Brigades International, um, these, these bigger organizations, whereas um, probably there are a lot of more local organizations or even just groups of people or movements um, that are doing this kind of protection work. Um, but that is not reflected in the literature. So that's one thing that, that we can look at. Um, when it comes to the specific aspects of UCP, um, so for example, non-partisanship is, is an important aspect or non-violence. Um, there is some comparison between different organizations and different ways of doing UCP, but mostly it focuses then on one of these aspects. Um, so it will, for example, look at how an Peace Brigade International thinks of nonpartisanship and international solidarity um, network in Palestine, how they both think about nonpartisanship. And what this means um, is that we we can we can study the, the way in which different organizations do UCP, I think, in a lot more depth than what has been done so far. Um, there is um, uh, there is some evidence in regards to its effectiveness, so to show how UCP works and that it works, um, but it's still quite um, specifically focused on some organizations and some regions. Um, and when you compare this to the literature on unarmed, um, unarmed peace building, for example, or peacekeeping, um, it's just, it's, it's not in any, it's not the same level, right? So we, so we can do a lot more in-depth studies of that. Um, and that relates to the next point, which is the evidence of impact. Um, so how in the long run, there's a lot of literature that suggests um, UCP contributes to the building of positive peace. So one way it, in which it works is shaping, creating the space in which these peace processes can take off and can really flourish. Um, but the, but the, um, the actual literature or the research done on how that works and the um, the kind of the, the, the different systems and, and processes that go on, um, we can we can try and learn a lot more about that. Um, and there is some um, theoretical work that is being done, but then a lot of the research that has been done is quite focused on um, specific cases. So it's usually built on case studies. Um, so there can be a lot more like overarching theorizing on um, what UCP is and um, what the what the most important aspects of it are, um, like nonviolence, for example, which is a thing political theorists care about. <laughs> um, but then, in relation to UCP, it can be studied in a bit more depth. Um, so there is uh, the the last point on this slide um, is that there that we know um, we don't know enough yet on how to expand UCP. So how can it be scaled up? Can it be applied in other cases, for example? Um, so that's that's a, another gap in the literature that that can be um, that can be studied. So all in all, we think there's there's a lot of literature already out there, and we've collected. I think most of I dare to say most of it because, like Beer had said, we have about seven hundred items in the database, so that's quite a lot. Um, but there's a, a lot of work still to be done. Now, what I've been doing is kind of making a, an overview um, of what research is already out there, um, and I'll, I'll share that with you. Um, but uh, but so the topics that have been covered, so the, the literature that you can find um, is on how UCP works, um, what the history of the concept is. Um, so there's, it's not, I mean, it's quite a new, term but it's it has historical roots um, there's some studies on good practices and there are also some um, studies on the characteristics of UCP um, so what is the role of relationships for example um, what is this how does impartiality or this nonpartisanship aspect of UCP work nonviolence the primacy of the local all these things are reflected in the literature to some extent there's some 
information on specific organizations. So there'll be some academic articles on Peace Building International or Nonviolent Peace Force. Um, you'll also be able to find some, some academic work on UCP and armed peacekeeping and kind of looking at the different assumptions each of these two forms of peacekeeping makes and how they compare to each other. And there's a growing literature on self-protection. Now I find all of this, the self-protection literature, so how communities protect themselves um, is still quite new. Um, so there's, I think, a lot to be explored there. Um, but there are studies on civilian agency and resilience on community-based protection, um, and in particular zones of peace or peace communities. Um, but again, that last literature on, on zones of peace is quite focused on um, Latin America, for example. So I think there's quite a lot to be explored. Um, and then there's also some literature on gender privilege and colonialism in, in the practices of UCP um, and how this, and that's also the, the name of the, this research network is the notion of space and how this safer space is being created. So this is the uh, literature report I've been working on. So here you can see all the themes that are reflected in the, in the literature and then basically per point I've just um, I've just explained a bit about the research that there is, um, and I give you some suggestions to start um, your, your, your literature search. Um, so if you want to know more, for example, about the history of the concept, um, there are some suggestions um, you can have a look at. Now you can find these suggestions, I'm gonna to have to stop and share this one again and find the research database. So for example, here it says um, identity number, Hundred, um, and I'll show you where you can find them. This is the the research database uh, on an armed civilian protection literature. Um, so you, I will all let you know how to get there and how to log in and things. Um, but this is basically where you can find all the documents and the information that we've been um, gathering. Um, so this is where you can find them. There's a library, lots of information here. Um, there's still, it's still work in progress, but for example, we can try and see if we can find number 100. And then you can see, you can find this document, the origins and development of an of peacekeeping. So they will match with, the, with the, the literature review and the report that we can send you. So basically it's a way for you to get, to say, okay, I, I'm interested in the history of this concept. I'm going to look at what literature is already there. And then you can find the literature in the database and basically then build your own research from there. So that's how we've kind of designed, designed this. So I think, what is kind of clear and yes there's a question here in the chat where we get a link to this later yes that's our idea that we share with you how you get there how you enter this database and we also share this overview document where Suzanne has kind of collected these different topics and gives some idea of where perhaps to start reading if you have never read into it so that you're not overwhelmed by everything that is there um, so we will share that with everybody. And the idea is really that this is a resource you can use in your work or in your research um, to start if you want to think about looking a bit more in detail into unarmed civilian protection. Um, now, the idea of our research network, so this is a, a network um, that is uh, uh, financed by um, the UK Research Councils through official development assistance money under a scheme that's called Global Challenges Research Fund and is a network that is set up to run um, for four years. Um, I'll say a little bit at the end, there are some caveats at the moment because of politics in the UK. I'll say a little bit about that at the end. Um, but the, the kind of the general idea is that we have four years to kind of jointly work on furthering our understanding um, of unarmed civilian protection and also to contribute kind of practically to spreading kind of the knowledge about it and to bring it um, to different levels from the community level to kind of um, high level uh, actors. This kind of idea that there is a different story of security out there so that security is not always linked automatically um, to violence, but actually that there are actors who show that you can work non-violently, um, which basically makes protection 
a, a resource that is available to everybody if you only uh, know what these strategies are. Now this research network has kind of um, three uh, different strands of, of activity and what we are doing here today is part of the first strand which is about networking. Uh, so networking partners in the different regions where we work, either organizations who are already working on this, organizations who want to work uh, more with uh, nonviolent strategies of protection, but also researchers to really see this as a new emerging field and maybe something you can be a pioneer in um, to do research in your area on this specific topic and maybe combine it with the other work you are doing. I think uh, Shantana mentioned that uh, some of you are peace building researchers in your re region and Suzanne already mentioned where there could be a link perhaps between um, an uncivilian protection and peace building as well because there is an idea and I, I very much share this idea as a kind of a theoretical concept but we haven't studied this yet that by by doing protection work, so by halting, by, by deterring violence or transforming violence or preventing violence through nonviolent means, there's a different kind of horizon and a different perspective of what peace can mean. So if you can, can have a nonviolent environment through, non, through nonviolent means, it, there's a different story about peace, uh, what follows after the um, the violence has ended so it's not a cycle or a spiral of violence anymore but as Suzanne said this hasn't been particularly uh, tested yet so the first strand is really about networking people interested in this and building the kind of capacity to do the research and the the database is one part of this capacity building because it gives you a shortcut into the literature that is already out there and which is quite limited still Maybe 700 items sounds like a lot, but compared to what there is about peace building, it's almost nothing. So it's a very small field still. Um, and um, and uh, Shanshai will later on share a bit what is planned in the region in terms of these workshops that Shantana already mentioned, where we will talk a bit about how best to do research on such a topic as unarmed civilian protection and what potential ways of doing research um, there are that somehow fit the spirit of nonviolent protection work, which very much takes place at the basic level of communities, so at the very local level. It's not a top-down endeavor, it's a work with communities um, to build up that protection capacity from below. And I think this is something we would like to encourage that this is also how we should think about the research being done on it, rather research from below than from the top down. Now, the second strand of what we are going to do um, is we want to do and encourage research on unarmed civilian protection. And we have outlined three areas where we think we could um, contribute to a wider, wider understanding, uh, but also to kind of to narrow it down to let's say three topics to not get overwhelmed with everything there is. And these three topics that we want to specifically focus on, and they are still very broad, are the three you see here on the slide. Understanding vulnerability to physical harm and conflict is the first one. The second one would be building local protection infrastructures. And the third one, developing civilian protection capabilities. And I'll say something about each of the three. Okay, so what do we mean by understanding uh, vulnerability? Um, vulnerability is something that was specifically mentioned in the call for projects that we applied to with this uh, network. Um, but uh, I felt like in, the, in this call for proposals, it was a very um, kind of traditional and one-dimensional understanding of vulnerability. So thinking about specific people or categories of people, let's say children or women who are particularly vulnerable to violent conflict and therefore need to be protected somehow by outside actors. Um, but I think what we would like to do is kind of unpack this idea of vulnerability a bit more by asking, so who is vulnerable to what, in which context and at which times if you think a bit about violent conflict in um, your region, um, quite often in conflict areas, it's kind of uh, young men, for example, who are particularly prone, or men in general, who are particularly prone to be um, forcefully uh, 
forcibly recruited into armed groups. So you could say there's a there's a group there of people who are vulnerable to forced recruitment. Um, but usually when there is international discourse about vulnerability, they are not mentioned. So they're not seen as a group of vulnerable people. Also, when we talk about, about vulnerabilities, quite often um, it puts people into some sort of victim position only. Um, and what we like to, would like to do is also to look at, so this is the second point here, to look at the agency of people, right? So people are not just vulnerable. Quite often they also have agency or we can kind of um, uh, support their agency so that, that they can actually do something um, in terms of, for example, early warning, early response to violence. So there is agency that people already have or people can, can develop this agency um, with regard to nonviolent protection. And one idea is to look into the agencies that are there already and how these can be supported from the outside. Um, and a third point that strikes me when I look at the international discourse of vulnerability is that the idea is quite often that there needs to be kind of some sort of outside actor coming in and uh, helping to protect uh, vulnerable people kind of in a top-down manner. So it's very patronizing. And I think that's the point that Suzanne mentioned. There's a small but growing literature also looking at and how far actually the idea of protection is quite paternalistic and quite colonial in a way. So there are people who need to be protected from something. But quite often um, communities and, and individuals have already developed some sort of idea of how to reduce their vulnerabilities. There are already strategies there and it would be really wrong. And it's something that kind of armed peacekeeping quite often does. It comes in and things, the peacekeepers think they know how to best do things and they don't ask. But I think the, the, the advantage of unarmed civilian protection is that it works with communities and from the local level and with the primacy of local actors. So basically local actors are center stage and they're being listened to. And I think this is something um, we, can, we can study further how, how unarmed civilian protection can be promoted without undermining what is already there. So basically, so this is the first point on the slide here. It's this idea of thinking a bit away from vulnerability only to actually, um, yes, uh, uh, kind of communities and individuals who are vulnerable, who are more prone to receive uh, physical harm, but who also have a protection agency or who can be supported in their protection agency. Um, so we could think, for example, about case studies um, of existing unarmed civilian protection and self-protection experiences when we think about research, so maybe working with the community to ask these questions um, or uh, work on kind of communities where there is not yet um, a specific kind of non-violent protection strategy in place, but where there could be, where there's a real need. Um, so I think that's, that's something um, that could be uh, thought of. The second one, uh, the second area of research that we would encourage people to think about when thinking about um, uh, research on unarmed civilian protection is what we've termed here building local protection infrastructures. What does that mean? Um, I think the idea is here to look at how different kind of levels or different scales of initiatives in nonviolent protection can work to better, to get together for the best outcomes for the people who, uh, who are um, under threat um, or who are harmed um, by physical violence. So that could be outside protection strategies and actors, so these international organizations that come into countries to help, national protection initiatives, um, but also kind of self-protection mechanisms which are already working in the communities. And I think, as Suzanne said, there's more about the international actors coming in and a little bit about the national actors and a little bit about the um, self-protection uh, strategies, um, but how these work together and how these can work together without undermining each other in order to protect as many people as possible. I think there is still a sort of a gap um, there of where we need to understand more how this actually works and, and also kind of maybe have a, 
have a more critical look also at things that didn't work. So where, where things have been um, tried in the past and where perhaps really international actors have undermined something that was already there. So there's a certain tendency also in the literature because this is such a small area of, of practice um, and quite a lot of the people who have written about it are both academics, but also practitioners who have been working on this before, perhaps, and then write about it academically to kind of defend uh, an amphibian protection and to show that it works, which is a good thing, because it's, it's, this field is kind of arguing against this huge field of armed, armed protection and armed peacekeeping. But at the same time, we have to remain self-critical, I think, in our work. And I think there could be more done with this. And again, this could be uh, uh, in terms of case studies of work that is already being done in different countries. And again, it's research with communities and groups rather than on them, I would say, um, which is something I come to in, at the end, what type of research we would like to encourage. So the third area is about this idea of expanding unarmed civilian protection. So what Suzanne also already mentioned. So there is a certain move by some organizations to say there's such a huge need. So there are 68 million people at the moment being who are uh, uh, who have been forcefully forcibly displaced from their homes. Um, most of the people who die in violent conflicts are civilians and so on. There's a huge need for this protection from physical harm, not even to speak about all the other sorts of protection from, from um, marginalization, from hunger and from all sorts of other things, but just the kind of protection from the very kind of physical harm to people. The, the need is so huge that we have to somehow um, broaden out this knowledge about unarmed civilian protection. Um, but then the question is, so can it, can this be scaled up or broadened out? So can more people do it, more different communities and organizations included in their work? Or could the existing organizations just have bigger missions and do more and more of the same, but with more people and so on? And there are some voices who say, yes, it is very necessary that we do this specifically because unarmed civilian protection, because it's from the bottom up is something that can work in all sorts of contexts and even where international organizations and, and kind of uh, regional organizations are not willing to intervene and are not able to intervene. So think of the example of Myanmar, um, when you look um, at some of the things that people are putting on, on, on Twitter and the kind of, the kind of calls for the responsibility to protect, which is an international concept, which would work here very well, which basically says when states are unwilling or unable to protect their own uh, populations, so when, when the states commit the human rights violations en masse on their people, there is a responsibility for the international community to do something about it. But then you also have the reality of international politics, so for the US. And for example, to do something, the Security Council has to agree on it. But then you have veto powers like China who say, no, we don't want this, for example, right? So unarmed civilian protection, because it's a very kind of low key and bottom up approach can work in situations where international organizations are just where they have their hands tied and they can't really do much. So I think there's a huge potential here, but the question is, how do you do that without losing the spirit of this being led by the actual communities who are being protected to not come in and impose and patronize and colonize, but to still work with people from the bottom up when, when this, this grows to something bigger. The inclusion of new actors and collaborations, of course, you can think of more and more civil society organizations actually getting to know um, the strategies and perhaps in, including them in their work, which is great. But there's also a debate, for example, whether um, kind of yeah, actors like, like uh, UN uh, peacekeeping uh, missions um, could use uh, protection, unarmed civilian or nonviolent protection work in their strategies, or whether that would be harmful to the idea of nonviolence, because then you would have state actors and international organizations using something that specifically started as a non-state strategy to protection. So would it dilute the idea? Would it undermine the idea of, of non-violence and civilian to civilian protection of um, 
state actors did it. Um, so these are kind of the questions that are out there. Um, they are questions of, they could be questions of theory. So international theory, for example, it can be questions of practice, questions of advocacy. Um, and uh, again, I think there is a, a broad scope of what we could look into um, to address these questions. Now, one of the things we also said in the network is that we would like to encourage research to be um, participatory and to also um, perhaps be crea pre creative, use creative methods. And um, the reason why we say that is because um, research like participatory action research, where researchers work with communities and with organizations doing work on the ground to come up with the questions in the first place and then work together to answer these questions, seem to be very much in line with the spirit of unanswerable protection, which is also kind of working with the communities to come up with the ideas of what needs to be done. So, of course, it depends a bit on the question you have, um, the question you pose on unanswerable protection. There are different ways of doing it. Um, so, there might be some rather high level questions that can't be answered through work with communities. But sometimes, so for example, this question about the vulnerabilities and agency is something I could imagine very well as a research that is being done with communities rather than on communities. Um, so where, where the specific questions are developed with the people who are actually affected and where, um, uh, where community members can also work as researchers help to contribute to the research themselves. And then we also said, yeah, creative or arts-based methods might be um, quite good to use. And there are two reasons for it. One reason is that sometimes if we only use standard social scientific methods, we are very much focused on language. So on people telling us something, being able to say exactly what they think, um, uh, putting things in words. Um, but what this underestimates is the power relationships we sometimes have in when we do a focus group, for example. Um, and also that sometimes we have, we, we know something, but it's really hard to put that in words. Maybe we haven't formulated it, it yet. And these are also obviously quite traumatic topics, um, violence and so on. So arts-based methods or creative methods can sometimes help to, to create that dialogue, to bring in other voices that perhaps are normally marginalized, to bring in other people. And it has the second advantage, and this is my last point, um, that it also creates interesting outputs. So research obviously creates outputs in terms of texts we write as researchers, we write articles or as civil society organizations, you write reports, and this is all very important. But sometimes to bring across the value of something to other people, if you have something like a documentary film or a graphic that shows something or a, a, a drawing or whatever it is, uh, enables you to bring it across on a more kind of emotional level. And I think this is great for our third strand of our research network, which is my last point here, which is about dissemination and impact. So we would like to jointly then also, whatever the outputs are or the outcomes are of our research, whatever the findings are, to jointly kind of bring this across to the communities, to um, other organizations who might be interested and also kind of to high level organizations, for example, in Asia, to ASEAN, to understand more what the value is of really rewriting that narrative of security away from weapons and towards kind of civilian, civilian to civilian protection. So people protecting themselves and others in nonviolent ways. So I don't know for how long I've spoken here, I'm sorry, but I, I, I think this is my last slide and I think I've come to an end uh, here. But this is what we would like to invite you to, to participate in with our network. 